Now, word to vec really kicked off because it had this fancy example. King is to a boy as queen is to, and Paris is to France as Berlin is to Germany. Yeah, so you had some examples where you would get this type of math working. Except that it was actually not trained to support this type of math. It's kind of more of a coincidence to some extent that this works. And there's a lot of cherry picking in there. But since it's got a lot of attention and people really like the idea of computing similarities between words, even if it's words and not documents, a lot of research was kicked off by this. Can we move from words to a similarity of documents, for example? Can we improve the handling of rare words? So I'm going to talk about some of them today. The first part is what can we actually do to understand what is going on? So there's a series of works in 2014, 2015, that tries to interpret what this does. Because if you look at the paper and at the proposal of word 2 back, I think it didn't even re re receive very good peer review. I think it was only accepted as a poster. Because it's kind of just, well, we tried this and it worked. There, there is not really much theory in why and how and all of this. So why should we choose the context with? Why should we choose this activation function? So why should we choose a certain dimensionality? Or just chosen because it worked. And it's this later work that tries to understand what is going on in here. And it turns out that we can consider this to be a type of a matrix factorization. So we have kind of an input vector, we have this output vector, and if we multiply them, which is what is happening in the center of word to vec we have still the softmax on the one side and like this one encoding on the other side, but um, in the very central part, there is this multiplication of these two matrices, and we're trying to find the maximum of this multiplication. That means there is a matrix where we are looking at the, the values of the products, every input to every possible output. So every possible context to every possible word. Now the context are just the sum of the words, so we can just take every word. It's occurring approximately at the same time. So kind of taking every input vector multiplied every output vector. So we have a, if you mul would multiply the two weight matrices, we get a matrix X that is like the size of our voc vocabulary. And if we have a very high value in there, that means the vector is occurring in the context of another vector. So that's like a co-occurrence. The values in this matrix, they are high if words are very likely to be neighbors in the text, in this five word window. So there's this matrix called pointwise mutual information, PMI. That's the logarithm of the two words occurring together divided by them being randomly drawn. So by chance occurring together. Are they more often neighbors than by chance? Then we get a larger value in here. And that is similar to the matrix X. Now this is a matrix factorization. We're kind of trying to factorize this PMI matrix when we do training word to vec. And we're training it to predict co-occurrence of words. That is exactly what we're doing there. We're more focused on the, the shape of the vectors, 
and having the softmax in there that slightly modifies this, but the softmax kind of leads to this being unlocked in here. So that is already in here. And if you want to go a bit more formal, there is some hidden factor also, in, there are some factors in the word to vec to account for word frequencies and all of this. So it turns out that we would have to put in a power of three divided by four in here and log k if we're doing negative sampling with k negative samplers. And then we get this negative SIP gram with negative sampling word to vec version. But it is an implicit matrix factorization. We're not doing it explicit as when we are looking at non-negative matrix factorization, for example, we are considering what is our objective function and then trying to do these multiplicative updates. But we are just saying, okay, we have these matrices and now we're doing gradient descent as always. It turns out that if we t just take this matrix or this matrix and do a truncated SVD, we get similar results. Not quite as good, but still pretty good. We are maybe too, if we do SVD, we are trying to make the, the least squared errors on these values small. But the least squared error on these values is not as good as the actual prediction. If we're doing this with stochastic gradient descent in neural network, we are looking at predicting the actual correct word and not at keeping the prediction error at least squared in this case. So uh, that is what, probably why it still works slightly better. But nevertheless, this relationship to SVD of this matrix gives us some understanding in what we are doing in word to vec just that why do we need these terms, for example? Why is PMI the appropriate choice? So all, um, this, in this case, the analysis is retrofitted to word to vec trying to understand what it does. It's not saying this is the right thing to do. It's saying this is what word to vec ended up doing. Now we can look at what is the loss function, for example, that we are doing in word to vec So the probability of predicting some word wj given wi is proportional to this exponential of the product of the vectors. So um, this is the softmax. The second part of the softmax is hidden in the proportional to the normalization. And this is like the neural network, the multiplication of the matrices of the two vectors. And then we have the side constraint that these are um, made to sum up to one, that is the proportional two part. Now for um, skip gram, we also have like this, this negative samples and we predict each word of the context separately. And in the Zeebo model, where our input is the entire context, we are taking the sum of the context. And using the sum of the context to predict the next word. That's kind of why it is more complicated to formally analyze the Zeebo. But that is like the um, loss function that the neural network ends up optimizing. Again, it's not was why do, that it was postulated this way. It was engineered this way, it was built and run and it worked and then this is afterwards. What did we actually do? Now there are some cases that makes this more uh, explicit. So um, the, uh, we need to, for example, do an approximate softmax. So finding that word which maximizes this means we would need to iterate over all of them. But testing all words in this matrix, which is huge, is expensive. So um, there are some approximation techniques to make this faster. 
So hierarchical softmaps, aggregating in pairwise in four and eight and all of this um, helps. And in training, we do this negative sampling to not have to test to exactly compute the, the missing parts. But otherwise, backpropagation, stochastic gradient descent. Now we can, so that is how we optimize this. Stochastic gradient descent, backpropagation. That means there's some error that we need to, to normalize. And we do know that there's like this output word that we want to have. We have our input. We can transform our input to the desired output and then uh, compute the delta between, of them, between them, the gradient. And since there is a single hidden layer, we don't need to go much farther with the back propagation in one step. So we end up, we need a learning rate, and then we can compute the error between the vectors and modify each vector towards the target that you want to have. We want to have the vector produced by the matrix operations to be similar to every good output vector. So in the skip gram with negative sampling case, we have the input vector boy, and we want the output to be similar to dog chase playground. So we get the vectors for dog chase and playground and make them similar to what we get got. And we need to make the vector that we got, the matrices, make a better vector, a more similar vector. But that would just lead to all vectors become the same if we do this. If we always just make vectors similar, all vectors will eventually converge to the same value. So we also need to make something not match. We need wrong predictions. So we need bad outputs. So words that we just do not observe in this context. But we don't take all of them. That would be too expensive. We sample some negatives. So as many good ones as negatives, for example. So context width of 10 means we have 10 good examples. So we take 10 random words from the corpus and use these as negatives. And then do a gradient descent. Now, this was very heuristic. They, they built this, these matrices and, and the network, and it worked, interestingly enough, and published it, and it totally kicked off. People try to say, OK, now that we understand what it tries to do with this type of matrix factorization, maybe we can make this more direct, more smart. And one of these solutions is called GLOVE global vectors, global vectors for word representation. So if we aggregate all the word occurrences over the entire corpus, then we can say the skip gram model tries to optimize this part. That's the co-occurrence. Given the, um, our current word, how likely are we going to predict the neighbors? So it's about words co-occurring aggregated over all the, the neighbors. This J is like an offset moving left and right, and uh, except zero. That, so there's no zero in here, because that would be the word itself. And if you aggregate this, eventually it will just be on how often do the words co-occur, divided by this, um, or multiplied with this uh, logarithm. And instead of like this thing here was coming from the softmax in word to vec that's not much theory in there. This part is understandable. So that's what where we want to work on. And in GLOVE, they apply a weight function to the co-occurrences, which can like downweight where extreme values emphasize small values, for example. And in the second part, 
they look at the divergence. So we want to make the distribution that we get from this, which is the reconstructed matrix. So x minus wh transposed log squared. That's the reconstruction error. The reconstruction error is measured as a divergence since we put in the logarithm in here. But if we consider the matrix X to be a probability distribution over words co-occurring, that's the matrix that we're factorizing. And we want to make a matrix that has the smallest divergence from the probability, true probability distribution. So divergence is a choice that makes sense from theory. It's distributions. And for the weight, that is subjective choice. So we just say this is some function f. So that, that is what, what Glav did to um, make this a more formal approach. And in some cases, Glav works nicer. In other cases, it doesn't. So it's very subjective choice, which one we prefer. They still have the same issue. We are working on the word level. But the word level is, let's say, nice for, for example, for translation, machine translation. But what if you want to find similar documents? Then we don't need vectors on the word level. We need vectors on a paragraph or a document level. And that led to paragraph vectors and a method called doc to vec, document to vector, also by uh, the same author, Nikolov, as, lead, as main author. And it is a very canonical extension of word to vec, except that we also add a one hot encoding of the document, the sentence or the paragraph occurs in. Now, since we are processing documents in order, we don't even have to look it up. Just whenever there's a new document, we get a new vector. Formally, it means our matrix would have one additional row for each document. And now we are optimizing the same way as we did in word to vec except that to the context, we also add a, word, a document vector. And then make the document vector like closer to the prediction and the other way around. And then we can train this vector along. And that get, works decently well for uh, like in a closed world. So for embedding a corpus of documents, we get a document vector for each of them. And that's fine. It gets more complicated if you want an out of corpus document because that one doesn't have a one hat encoding, that would be a one back here in a new row. And we don't have a vector there. So we have to somehow learn this vector then by iteration and um, like re refitting this and only grading the send on the single vector. Another pro extension that is important, and that's the, the last slide for today, is fast text. Fast text is also by the word to vec author, but I think at that time he was already at Facebook. And it solves one important problem of word to vec namely, it works with out of corpus document words. The original word to vec, it was trained only on frequent words except stop words. But what if we have a rare word? And for some languages, we do are more likely to see this. So in German, you have a lot of compound words. And they may be too rare in the training corpus. So what to vec would not have an embedding for this. Fast text was trained on a dozen or 20 or 30 languages. They really wanted to go multilingual with this. So this was becoming a problem. And the approach that they chose to improve the quality on rare words and unseen words is to work with character engrams additionally. So if we don't have the word, we still have the engrams. 
And by the way we train, the engrams will be similar to the words they occur in. So these fit together. They will be consistent. And if you do an engram, an example, we get groups of three letters. And that means we have x, xa, xam, example, and, and so on. We do want some placeholder padding values in here to get more of them and to capture the beginning of the word better. And now we can uh, you exploit that if we have a compound word, such as tisch tennis, which is table tennis, it shares a lot of n-grams with tisch, with table, and with tennis. So it ends up that the, if tisch tennis is an unseen word, the vector will be approximately the average of Tisch and the tennis. And that is quite decent. That will match human intuition of these compound words quite well. If we see an unknown uh, compound word, we will assume it's a combination of them. Now, eventually, these models become too large because there's a lot of these combinations. So um, there has been some attempts to compress these models to reduce the memory consumption and all of this. OK, that's it for today. And next week, we'll be working on deep learning and deep models. <laughs>